fired up. These are our peers, these are Jeffers, and they are out here, and they are, these presentations are fantastic. So, um, I, I should tell you, a friend of mine asked me to come speak to the Air Force Academy to some cadets, and when I told him that I wanted to talk on this topic, success off the golden career path, I got uninvited. So, um, I don't know what that says about our institutions, but, uh, so this is success off the golden career path, or as I call it, how I got from here, to here, to here, back to here, to here, and finally to here. It was harder than you think, but I think everyone in this room knows what I'm saying when I talk about the golden career path. How many of you know what the golden career path is in your community or your industry? Right, it's the approved path. It's the path of least resistance, the one the institution, the service, the company says you should follow in order to be successful, right? How many of you are on the golden career path? Yeah, surprising, right? Innovators, entrepreneurs, we tend not to follow the golden career path. We're disruptors. Uh, sometimes we find ourselves off the golden career path inadvertently. Sometimes we find ourselves off the golden career path by choice. And sometimes it's a combination of the two. So I've had a very non-standard career path for a fighter pilot. Um, I've enjoyed all the fighter pilot commentary, by the way, so far in the conference. Thank you, Thank you for that. Um, and uh, I have, I think, three ideas or three solutions as I've looked at my career that have made me successful. So the first thing I want to talk about is this clash of cultures. We have, in the military side, a, uh, a mindset that you just do the best job you can in the role that you're in, and someone will see you, will notice you, and will scoop you up for promotion for the next assignment, for the next school, and reward you. So this, this is actually has a word in the feminist business literature. It's called the tiara effect. And it afflicts women in particular um, because they think that if they just stay in their cubicle and do a good job, someone's going to notice and lift them to the C-suite. So we know that that doesn't work in the business world. And we know it certainly doesn't work in the entrepreneur world. You have to sell yourself. Ryan's War on the Rocks initiative was not successful because he quietly sat in his living room and typed, right? He sold War on the Rocks. He went out and, and branded it. He thought hard about who we should connect with, who we should talk to. Chris O'Keefe got here and talked about having a board of directors. That's reaching out. That is, as we say in the military, it's, it's networking. Now, it's a bad word in the military, right? Networking is about self-promotion. It's about um, losing your humility, losing your, your humbleness. Um, and we think that it's, it's not the right path, right? People are going to notice if you're doing a good job. You don't need to tell them you're doing a good job. So how do you blend these two cultures? I actually have, I think, a solution, and it's been helpful to me. And that is that service is bigger than right now. Service is not about necessarily just doing the best in the job you're doing, but thinking about how you can best fulfill the institution, whether that's the Air Force, for me, or the armed forces, or the nation. How do I take the skills that I want to have, the ones that I have, uh, the attributes, the knowledge, and how do I find the right place for me to serve to be of even more use? And I think that blends the two mindsets a little bit better. So I started calling it something different. I call it building bridges, not networking. And there's a couple reasons for that, and that's, that's what I'll get to now. Oops, nope, I'll get to next, sorry. I to remake my slides, I apologize. So what about networking? So building bridges is about three dimensions. Um, I had that conversation with a guy when I first got to Georgetown. We talked, as we're chatting, he's like, I just want you to know I'm building my network down right now. So what does that even mean? To me, that's mentorship, that's leadership, right? You don't build your network down. But actually, if you think about that, if you build them in three dimensions, if you build 360 degrees, you actually are building a coalition people below you, so you can, like Chris O'Keefe say, hand it off to the next generation. Uh, people above you can be your board of directors, and then your peers, like the people in this room. The second thing is, build bridges outside of your institution. I got my job on the joint staff right now. I work for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. I got it from a connection in a civilian institution that I had done more than a decade before. So some people say that's coincidence, that's convenience. 
But I actually think that's about building bridges. I didn't get it because my commander thought I should get the job. I didn't get it because the Air Force thought I should get the job. A friend from a scholarship many years before put in a good word, got me an interview, and I got the job. So build your, build your bridges outside of your current network. People on the Golden Career Path do a good job actually building bridges. They just do it inside the path, right? It's all linear, it's all up, um, and, and that doesn't work if you're off the Golden Career Path. The last thing I would say is network to your subject expertise. My mother is uh, an attorney, she's a judge now, is an attorney, and she uh, hated networking. She hated business card events, she wouldn't come to something like this. What she did was she taught in the legal community on bankruptcy, which was everybody's favorite subject, as you might imagine. Um, and so she built her network through subject matter expertise. When other attorneys had clients that went bankrupt, her name was the first one that they thought of uh, to send them to. When other attorneys had questions on bankruptcy law, they thought of her. And so she built her network through her subject matter expertise, through being out there, through writing, through speaking, and that kind of thing. Okay. Step two, how many people here ski? How many people snowboard? Okay. I grew up in Colorado. My parents did not enjoy skiing, so I did not ski very often. And I never progressed past the snowplow part of skiing. Um, as much as I like breaking the sound barrier in my jet, I don't actually like going fast down a mountain where the only thing between me and trees is, you know, a jacket. So um, I'm going to say something nice about my husband who's taking pictures of me right now because I'm going to say something not so nice in a second. So <laughs> he's amazing. He's brilliant. He's going to speak a little later today. Um, on one of our early dates, my husband, the then boyfriend, decided that he wanted to teach me to snowboard. Teach me to snowboard. It basically involved strapping a snowboard on, where he then would snowboard down part of the mountain, look up at me and say, now just do what I did. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time on my face, I spent a lot more time on my rear, um, and after one excruciating run, excruciating for both of us, by the way, excruciatingly painful for me, excruciatingly boring for him, um, we made it down to the bottom of the mountain, and I cleared him off. I said, this isn't fun for you, it's certainly not fun for me, I'm going to try and figure this out for myself. So I went back up to the top of the mountain, and here's what I learned. There is no snowplow in snowboarding. You have to commit. The faster you go, if you commit to going down the mountain, you get enough speed to be able to turn that corner. You get enough speed to be able to stay on your feet. If you try and go slow, you fall down a lot. The same is true with success off the golden career path. If you don't commit, deliberately or not deliberately, and you try and think you're just doing an excursion, a quick little PhD, and then you're gonna get right back on, then you're, you're fooling yourself. And those are the people who struggle. Those are the people who try and reintegrate, thinking that somehow the Golden Career Path is going to accept their excursion, value their excursion, and then try and, and use their excursion. That's not how it works, unfortunately. So if you're off the Golden Career Path, commit to being off the Golden Career Path. Now it can happen accidentally, it happened accidentally for me. I was one of that first group I just talked about who thought I could just do a quick excursion and then come back and lead a squadron and fly. Um, luckily for me, um, I was medically disqualified from flying, so I was off the Golden Career Path for good. In fact, from where I stand right now, I can't even see the Golden Career Path. Like, it's over a hill, there's a mountain range between us. Um, so, Ryan, it happened sort of deliberately, right? Initially he kind of toyed around with it, but he had to make a commitment at some point, quit his job, and, and commit to War on the Rocks full time. So commit, commit to it, and that will allow you to be successful, whether you do it deliberately or not. By the way, entrepreneurs, I think we all know this, that's partly why being an entrepreneur and an innovator is scary, right? Because you gotta commit. All right, so the last thing. Define your own success. Define your own success in the macro and in the micro. What does that mean? What do you want? What do you want today? Well, I want a degree. What do you want tomorrow? I want to be a general officer. What do you want in the midterm? Well, I'd like to lead people. What do you not want? I don't want to end up in the bowels of the Pentagon enter, entering data into a spreadsheet, guaranteed. Um, I don't want to spend 40 years and get, the, get to the end of it 
realize that I didn't value my family or, or I didn't let my, have my husband have the amazing career that he could have as well. And then what are you willing to lose? What are you willing to sacrifice? If you commit, if you get off the golden career path, are you willing to lose the star that you were hoping for? Are you willing to lose the promotion or the C-suite? And then what could you gain? Basic cost-benefit analysis. What you can gain, I don't think I'm talking to anyone in this room that doesn't agree with this, what you can gain off the golden career path, very often is worth far more than you could gain on it. So with that, I will take questions. So when you end up off the golden path, right, uh, and then you kind of hit that dead end, right, what happens then? Do you just kind of cut your losses and say, I did, did my best, time to get on a new golden path, or, or do you kind of start drilling through the mountain? What's your, your solution to that? So I think at that point, it's a great question. Um, I think you have a couple options. You can try and launch yourself to a new golden career path. Um, people do that all the time, right? They get out of the military, they get into Lockheed, or they join North of Grumman, and they hop onto the corporate ladder, and um, that's one way to do it. I don't know that that's a way that necessarily appeals to the folks that are interested in entrepreneurial business or innovation. Um, I think I'd get back to some of the lessons that a lot of the other folks have taught us, uh, which is gather your mentors, gather your, your network, gather your bridges around you, take advice, um, and make a decision as to whether this is part of the time to execute that exit strategy that Chris talked about, or it's the time to really buckle down and in your cycle of innovation and your cycle of transformation put your nose to the grindstone and push through. Um, but I don't think you make that decision on your own. Um, I think you do that in the, the safety and in the circle of trust of all the people that, that support you. <coughs> So uh, I think we also know you talk about the TR effect, how that's that's never the the effective the most effective strategy. We also know that the golden career path, as John pointed out, you know the uh, EA we didn't make master guns. Golden career path is is just doctrine that actually doesn't work for most people. Very few senior leaders actually follow the prescribed uh, career path, um, and so I was just kind of asking your thoughts on that about how. You, uh, double-edged sword or there's a, there's a, uh, a silver lining or uh, you know new opportunities come when, when you commit to something. Yeah, but thanks for bringing that up. I appreciate it. Um, so I kind of cut this out because I wanted to keep it on time. But the Golden Career Path is basically a myth. Um, the people who are mostly on the Golden Career Path, 95% of them don't actually make it to where they think they want to go. Right? They were on the path. We all know those folks. They did exactly everything right. And then those are the people who talk about luck and timing um, because they didn't they didn't get picked up to where they wanted to go. Um, the folks that are that do make it to the top often didn't do it on the golden career path. They committed to something else, and in that commitment process, were able to uh, build the network, build the bridges, build the expertise that ended up being valued. So I don't want to say it's a dice roll either way. That's not the case. The difference is that when you're on the golden career path, most of your choices are made for you. When you're off it, you get to do it for yourself. You have that agency. So at the very end of the day, especially if you're defining success for yourself, you determine whether you were successful, not the institution. So that's helpful. Thank you, Mayor.